Welcome to Leaping Larry's Revolutionary Reading Theatre. I think that's the perfect song for that video, isn't it? For Italians, he was all right. <laughs> uh, Italian. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Where am I? Oh yeah, I gotta change this text down here because we want this to now say reading. There, I set the sub goal for ten. Hopes of there reading. Okay, so last time we were talking about uh, what it means to establish Juche in ideology. Uh, the aspects of that, of course, most important being like knowing your own history, not basing, not complete, not using um, previous experience and theories as the criteria for how to engage in revolution in one's own country, etc. Well, Bup, you will have to play us some sometime. Huh? In, in the Red Star Vanguard. Oh, amongst the comrades. Here you go. Hey, one day. All right, so today we're going to talk about... And, oh, I should mention that uh, the aspect of establishing Juche in ideology is um, one part of... Maintaining the independent stand in revolution. So another part of in, of maintaining the independent stand in revolution is uh, seems obvious enough, but it definitely is not in practice obvious enough. Um, is independence in politics? Part two is independence in politics. Politics is of decisive significance in social life. Without independence in politics, it would be impossible to talk about independence at all. Duce in ideology is expressed above all by independence in politics. Meaning, of course, putting Duce, proving that you have Duce firmly established in ideology is expressed in those independence of politics and self-sufficiency in the economy, and self-reliance in defense. They are all guaranteed by independence in politics. And when we get to self-reliance and defense, um, I will, and also self-sufficiency in the economy, I will also be sure to uh, remind you that neither of those things excludes trading with others or working cooperatively cooperatively with others all it means that is if those others happen to not be able to trade with you or not trade with you that your people can survive right that's important in the imperialist world on both sides of the spectrum uh, the imperialist core in many senses but even more importantly their targets are made to be dependent on the imperialist system as a whole. In a breakdown in the breakdown in, in like trade can lead to disaster. Which is by the way a mistake I've I've mentioned before too. That was a mistake that the that the USSR um in later like in later stages that was a mistake that the USSR also made. And it was actually one of the things that made DPRK um, distance itself from USSR a little bit um, towards the end because they came to them with the strategy of you give us the raw materials, you sell us raw materials, and we'll produce it and sell it back to you. And their position was, 
like no that's not how so socialism can't be built like that on on those types of relations and if your economy or if something ever happens to you we would be left with nothing if we don't develop our heavy industry and uh famously you know we know what happened to the ussr and we can imagine how much worse it would have been for DPRK if they had not built up any of their heavy industry because of that suggestion. It would have been far worse than it was the overthrow of USSR. Maintaining independence in politics means upholding national independence and sovereignty of one's people, defending their interests and conducting politics by relying on them. As the leader instructed, political independence is the first criterion in the life and soul of an independent sovereign state. Only when a nation maintains political independence will it be able to ensure independence and freedom and be happy and prosperous. The revolution is a struggle to win political independence before anything else. Since all questions related to revolution and construction depend directly on politics, it can be said that the destiny of the revolutionary cause is determined, after all, by political independence. Kitty, what are you doing down there? Out <laughs> of control over it. Are you attacking my feet? Don't do that. Don't do that. Ow! Oh my god! You're a little bitey thing, aren't ya? Oh. Here. I'm trying to pick you up. <laughs> you are funny. You're funny. Oh, you're gonna. She's attacking my feet. Ouch. Sorry about that. And here's, this is, a, this is the most important part right here of how to maintain political independence. In order to ensure political independence, it is imperative to set up a people's government, aka a socialist government. Humanity's right to independence finds typical expression in state power. So the working class and the masses of the people to realize independence completely must first of all, become masters of state power. By the way, there's a quote by Lenin that said, socialism um, is all these things, but most importantly, socialism is when the people are in control of the state. God's name, are you doing that? Oh my goodness. You quit. Or... Sorry, she's biting, she was biting a cord. You cats keep me busy, don't ya? Only when they hold state power in their hands and become true masters of state and society will they be able to attain political independence and lead an independent life. Independent and creative life. In order to guarantee political independence, it is necessary to build internal political forces. Political forces are the main component of the revolutionary forces. Only when one builds strong internal political forces and relies on them will one be able to win and preserve sovereignty and ensure a political independent politics. If powerful internal political forces are to be developed, it is imperative to strengthen the party the leading revolutionary force and achieve the unity and solidarity of the whole entire population based on the worker-peasant alliance with the working class at its core. And I will actually share with you an important quote if I can find it here. What is most important here is to rally all the people closely around the party and the leader. When the party and the people are solidly united into a single political force, they will be able to display boundless strength and emerge victorious in the revolution and construction. 
And now um, what it means here is you have all the people rally closely around the party and the leader. And when they are all united into a single political force, it means that not only the people must have, um, you know, socialist politics and socialist independence, but the leader also must share their same interests, right? That's absolutely vital for the revolution. And again, um, something that I, I think was a big factor in leading to the undermining of USSR was the fact that this subsequent leaders of the USSR, Khrushchev, basically all of them, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, I mean, and they were working in during the time of Stalin and Lenin as well, right? And uh, these people like definitely were a huge detriment. Now, that's not to say that, um, of course, as I pointed out before, if people had uh, proper ideological education in those days, they would have been also better to, um, able to identify those reactionaries and use their uh, right to recall and their democratic centralist society in order to get rid of these renegades and these, these counter-revolutionaries. But... That's not what happened, and, you know, it is somewhat understandable because USSR, of course, was the first socialist state to take, like, power like it did, right? If you think about, like, early capitalist experiments and stuff in comparison, that's a tremendous success. Like, un unimaginable. And proves that it's a fundamentally different society, I think. Sebs. Welcome in, comrade Sebs. Get a show up for his, someone showed Sebs out. So that's what it means to rally all the people around the leader. I'm just trying to see if I can find this one quote that I just mentioned here because. Um, I do have a really good quote that talks that. Oh, yeah, here it is, I think. Yeah, yep, this is the one I was looking for. Okay, so the part we just read right here, right? Um, we're looking for that worker peasant alliance part. Yeah, right here. Worker peasant alliance with the working class at its core, right? Now, I want you to I want you to think about that. We're thinking about the working class, right? But what makes someone working class? Is it their social origin? Is it like where they is it where, what jobs they work at? Think of and and let's think about the way the Pat Sox do this, right? The Pat Sox like to say, "Oh, because you work at this particular thing or this is what happens, you're therefore not working class or something." Which I think is the wrong way to go about it because um what it does is it ignores the role of humanity's ideological consciousness in informing um, what class they serve, right? So it's sort of like a dogmatic way to look at it. And that's why here, comrade Kim Jong-il is saying, the question of the main force of re the revolution cannot remain invariable in any era, society, or revolution. Nor is it a question that can be solved only on the basis of class relations. Hence, regarding the working class as the main force of the revolution anytime and anywhere is an expression of a dogmatic viewpoint the preceding theory, towards the preceding theories and is not correct in principle either. And the thing I always point out is like, here you have to realize that you have to take that other class relation that is by so many Marxists not even considered a class relation, the colonial class relation between the settler class or the um, guardian class and the ward class. And so here in the West, you have to take that as part of your analysis, which means the white working class as a collective is not revolutionary. 
not the main force or the leading force of revolution. It's the people struggling against colonialism and continuing slavery. Not just wage slavery, like wrecked fucking slavery. Only legalized through a prison system. Which, by the way, Canada does, but with its native people. As I mentioned yesterday, the incarceration rate in Canada for uh, native men is 77%, while for uh, non-native people, it's 7%. Didn't you? If one is to ensure political independence, one must have one's own guiding thought. Work out one's policy by oneself in accordance with one's decisions and carry it through. AKA, don't copy the existing theories and think that that's, you just copy them and go to revolution. Which, again, is what these Pat Sox and reactionaries do and the funny thing about that is while they're doing it, they call decolonial thinkers and decolonial theorists purity fetishists. The main thing in politics is to formulate policies and implement them. It can be said that independent politics consists in formulating and implementing all policies independently yielding to foreign pressure and tolerating foreign intervention in politics or acting at the instigation of others would make it impossible to maintain principle and consistency and would lead the revolution and construction to failure. Our party has laid down and implemented all its policies independent in accordance with the interests of our people and the specific conditions of our country with the Juche idea as the only guiding ideology under the wise guidance of the leader, that is why it has always won shining to victories in the revolution and construction. In order to ensure independence in politics, it is imperative to exercise complete sovereignty and equality in foreign relations. Independence of a party and a state is expressed, after all, in foreign relations. To exercise complete sovereignty and equality in foreign relations is fundamental in ensuring political independence. Sovereignty is an inviolable right of all parties, all countries, and all peoples. There are big and small parties, big and small countries, and economically developed and underdeveloped peoples in the world. But all parties, all countries, and peoples are equal and independent. No one should encroach upon the sovereignty of others. No one should tolerate the encroachment on one's sovereignty. Independence is not confined, sorry, independence is not in conflict with internationalism, but is the basis of its strengthening. Just as the world revolution is inconceivable without the revolution in one's own country, internationalism, divorced from independence, cannot exist. As a matter of principle, internationalist solidarity must be based on freedom of choice and equality. Only when it is founded on independence will internationalist solidarity become based on free choice and equality and become genuine and durable. Our party is adhering to the policy of strengthening the solidarity of the socialist countries and the international communist movement on the basis of opposing imperialism and giving support to national liberation movements in colonies and the international working class movement, continuing advance to socialism and communism, and observing the principles of non-interference in each other's internal affairs, mutual respect, equality, and mutual benefit. Our country is also adhering to the policy of joining forces with non-aligned countries, the newly emerging nations, on the principles of respect for territorial integrity and state power, non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and of cooperating with all countries which are friendly towards us. In the future, too, we will uphold sovereignty and equality in foreign relations 
maintain the principle of combining independence with internationalism. That is the second part of maintaining independence, the independent stand in revolution. Okay, I'm gonna, f I think we might read this other one as well, thinking, and then we'll do the news. And then I got some videos too. Um, a comrade, one of the comrades left this one here in. At this. Oh, it was March of the Fire Ants. March of the Fire Ants sent this cartoon. Gonna check that out. And then we got DPRK Korea visiting uh, Masik Rong Ski Resort. Then I got a small, uh, short one from Electric Intifada that we I was got, wanting to check out. And then this one here was also left in the Discord. The president of Equatorial Guinea's daughter, brought up by Kim Il Sung in North Korea. I found this video very funny, and uh, we'll we'll look at why when we get to it. And then I'm gonna play some games, and we we're gonna chat about some things. And if anybody wants to join me while I chat in in the Discord, you're more than welcome. So the next part of maintaining the independent stand in revolution is number three: self-sufficiency in the economy. The economy is the material basis of social life. Economic self-sufficiency enables one to consolidate the independence of one's country and live independently. It provides a sure guarantee for Juche in ideology. Independence in politics and self-reliance in defense and ensures rich material and cultural lives for the people. In order to implement the principle of economic self-sufficiency, one must build an independent national economy. Building an independent national economy means building an economy which is free from, from dependence on others and which stands on its own two feet. An economy which serves one's own people and develops on the strength of the resources of one's own country and by the efforts of one's own people. Such an economy makes it possible to develop the productive forces quickly by utilizing the nation's natural resources in a rational and integrated way, improve the people's living standards continuously, strengthen the material and technical foundations of socialism, and increase the, national, the nation's political, economic, and military power. It also ensures the exercise of complete sovereignty and equality in political and economic affairs and international relations, and contributes to strengthening the world's anti-imperialist independent forces and socialist forces. It is vital to build an independent national economy, particularly in those countries which were backward economically and technically because of imperialist domination and plunder in the past. Only when they build an independent national economy in these countries will they be able to repel the new colonial policy of the imperialists, free themselves completely from their domination and exploitation, wipe out national inequality, and vigorously advance on the road of socialism. In order to build an independent national economy, it is essential to adhere to the principle of self-reliance in economic construction. Self-reliance is the revolutionary spirit and a principle of struggle of the communists in carrying out the revolution by their own initiative. One must believe in one's own strength and depend on it in economic construction. Just as in all other activities for the revolution and construction. A people who energetically struggle with confidence in their own capability will be able to do any difficult work. But a people who have no faith in their own power, but only look up to others, will not do anything successfully. Only when one mobilizes the efforts of one's people and the resources of one's country and relies on one's own financial resources and technology 
On the principle of self-reliance, will one be able to develop the economy quickly at one's own desire, overcome all difficulties, and bring prosperity to the country? If an independent national economy is to be built, the economy must be developed in a diversified and integral manner. Let me grab a, let me fill up my water right quick while the ad is playing. Thank you all for subscribing. Be right back. I got the good mug today, comrades. Uh. Uh. See? Get one of these too. Type exclamation mark swag store into the uh, ad and it'll take you to the. Kim Jong hitting the bong. That's me. That's my name. Just swag. Like this. The embroidered things actually have turned out really good from what I'm seeing from everybody. So like the... The hats and the patch. Apparently these turn out really good. There's the mug I've got right there. Mine's in the blue. Wait, mine's in... I think mine's in this color. Yeah, mine's in that color. So there you go. That's one way you can... Uh, stream if you, if you want some something back for it. All right, 33 seconds. Again, thank you so much for subscribing and supporting the channel or gifting somebody subs. Appreciate you all. Okay. Welcome back, people who were suffering through the ads. I take a bit of a longer ad break so that we can have a longer period of time in between ads, and also so that I get a good chance to, you know, have some water, talk with the talk with the Soviets for a minute. Thank you for bearing with me. If you want to avoid the ads, you know. Thank you. Uh, you could support our work and uh, get some fantastic little pictures at the same time. Awesome little internet pictures. All for all, and all you have to do is uh, join the Juche gang. <laughs> of course, the best way you can support my work, though, if we're being real. The best way you can support my work, of course, is through a direct donation. Because then Jeff Bezos doesn't get any of it. Alright, let us continue our read here. Unlike the capitalist economy, which is geared to make money, the socialist independent economy is always aimed at meeting the demands of the country and the people. Though an independent economy should naturally be developed in such a multifarious and integral way as to produce independent heavy and light industry goods 
and agricultural products to make the country rich and powerful and improve the people's living standards. Such an economy can also develop safely and quickly on a solid basis. In order to build an independent economy which is developed in a multifarious and comprehensive way, it is necessary, as our practical experience shows, to follow the line of giving preference to the development of heavy industry and developing light industry and agriculture simultaneously. Heavy industry with the machine building industry as its backbone is the pillar of an independent national economy. Heavy industry developed in such a way can guarantee economic and technical independence and exhilarate the development of light industry and agriculture and the national economy as a whole on the basis of modern technology. Moreover, simultaneous development of light industry and agriculture, along with heavy industry, can ensure a systematic improvement of the people's living standards and boost the development of heavy industry itself. Solving the problem of food on one's own through successful farming in particular is of tremendous significance in providing the people with stabilized living conditions and an independent life. Equipping the economy with modern techniques and training the nation's technical cadres on an extensive scale are indispensable for the construction of an independent national economy. Technical independence is absolutely necessary for economic independence. When one has one's own developed technique, will one be able to develop and use the natural resources of the country effectively and develop the national economy in a diversified manner? Developed technology also provides the possibility to free the working masses from back-breaking labor, narrow down the differences between physical and mental labor, and resolve independently difficult and complex problems arising in economic defense construction. Love how they're always they're already you know looking forward to freeing the masses from backbreaking labor. You know what I mean? Just from freeing them from that kind of labor altogether through a continuous revolution leading up to that point. Eliminating technical backwardness from the national economy and equipping it with modern techniques is a revolution. Only when the technical revolution is accelerated continuously through the mobilization of all possibilities in every sector will technology develop quickly and the country attain economic and technical independence in a short time. Solving the question of the nation's technical personnel a major factor in the struggle for economic and technical independence. This is essential for guaranteeing economic and technological progress by one's own initiative. This is a particularly important task in building a new society for those countries which were under the yoke of imperialism in the past and which consequently were far removed from modern science and technical development. Therefore, in order to undertake the technological revolution and attain economic and technical independence, one must put a lot of effort into the cultural revolution and thus raise the cultural and technical level of the working class, the working masses, and train an army of national technical cadres. We must resolutely implement the leader's policy of intellectualizing the whole society further raise the cultural and technical levels of the working masses, improve the qualities of technical cadres, and train more technicians. In order to build an independent national economy, it is necessary to establish reliable and independent sources of materials and fuel. Depending on others for raw material and fuel is as good as leaving one's economic lifeline in the hands of others. One is to be economically self-sufficient and develop the economy on a safe basis. In the long-term perspective, one must depend on one's own raw material and fuel sources and mainly meet one's own demand to the, for them. To this end, one must exploit the natural resources of one's country to the maximum and utilize them rationally and at the same time 
developed the industry to be juche oriented, one which relies on domestic raw materials and fuels from the outset. Building an independent national economy on the principle of self-reliance does not mean building an economy in isolation. An independent economy is opposed to foreign economic domination and subjugation, but it does not rule out international economic cooperation. Close economic and technical cooperation between socialist countries and newly emerging nations in particular plays an important part in ensuring economic self-sufficiency in these countries and in increasing their economic power. Today, the peoples of the newly emerging countries are struggling against the U.S. and other imperialist policy of aggression and plunder in defense of their national sovereignty, natural resources, and in order to put an end to the old economic order by which a few capitalist powers have exploited and plundered at the will of the majority of countries and peoples throughout the world, and to establish a new fair world economic order. The newly emerging countries have inexhaustible manpower, resources, and natural wealth, and huge economic potentialities. They also have a good deal of valuable experience and techniques which can be shared and exchanged. They strengthen economic and technical cooperation and vigorously struggle with their forces united. The newly emerging countries and peoples will be able to thwart the imperialist policy of aggression and plunder, uphold their national dignity and right to survival, and achieve economic self-sufficiency and prosperity in a short period without depending on great powers. The important task confronting us today in building the socialist independent national economy is to accelerate putting the national economy on a juche-oriented, modern, and scientific basis. As the leader said explicitly, putting the national economy on juche-oriented, modern, and scientific basis constitutes the strategic line that must be consistently followed in economic construction for socialism and communism. By pushing forward, Putting the national economy on a juche-oriented, modern, and scientific basis, holding fast to the line of building the independent national economy, we must further strengthen the independence, juche character of the national economy, continue to modernize technical equipment, and put all productive and management activities completely on a scientific basis. Exactly. It's, it's not that you're building in isolation, but it means that you can stand on your own two feet and you're not dependent on a predatory relationship, whether that's on, regardless of which end of it you're on, right? You know what? We're going to finish this whole part. We're going to finish the independent stand part by doing self-reliance and defense. And then the next time we read, we will be on part two, the second guiding principle of the revolution, that the creative method should be applied. This is not that long. This so the fourth part of the independent stand that must be maintained in revolution is self-reliance in defense. And this is uh, something that, like, let's 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 think of an example. Um, well, later on, USSR. Yo yo, thank you for the raid, unelectable. Welcome in, raiders. Uh, you all are well. Your stream went well, there, uh, Matt. Welcome in, raiders. Get comfortable. Holy shit. Oh, now I'm yawning. Welcome in. We're reading uh, Kim Jong-il on the Juche philosophy. We just talked about, we were just talking about how building an independent uh, economy, uh, maintaining independence in economic construction is vital for the revolution. 
uh, I was explaining how, of course, you know, Thomas Sankara, many others pointed this out, that how um, in any revolution, it's very important that your economy is built to stand on its own two feet, not dependent on others, whether you are... Um, whether you were the one dependent because you were um, the guardian or the oppressor, or whether you're the one dependent because you're the victim, right? Imperialism and, and uh, globalization, which is the raising of corporate law above any other national laws, um, all of these things exist in order to make other countries dependent on that world economic market which is really just the U.S. controlled hegemon market, right? How about trade? Huh? I, didn't I just... I, oh, what do you mean? Ha, uh, trading with others? I mean, yeah, that, that obviously, or sh I hope is obvious enough that that does not discount trading with others, you know? Having a self-reliant, self-sufficient economy doesn't mean that you don't trade with others. It just means that you don't agree to enter into predatory relationships with others on the ba on the on, under the veil of trade, as with as what uh, imperialist nations do. Like imperialist countries make people dependent by force. That's not trade. Trade is trade. Okay. Gotta go play with your sister. Or. Um. So the the f the next part that we're gonna talk about regarding um. Regarding uh, maintaining the independent stand in revolution is going to be self-reliance and defense and i was just pointing out how um you know i was actually just trying to think of an example of where this where somebody failed to do this and uh yeah you know the span the the spanish uh revolution was one where they failed to do this and uh as we know this it was like a coalition group it wasn't just anarchists that led this like contrary to what a lot of Fortunately, Western anarchists want you to believe it was not led by simply anarchists. It was a coalition of different leftist groups and uh, they failed to develop the necessary internal political military forces. And um, as a result, when USSR had to, I mean, and the USSR right up until um, the defeat was still sending um, aid, but the USSR also at the same time had to shore up its own defenses to defend its own people from what was going to be a Nazi invasion coming at any time, as far as they knew. Which is why it's so ridiculous when I hear, um, when I hear like certain people, mostly, mostly fucking Euros in the West, saying that, um, the communists betrayed the anarchists in Spain or something like this. Like, no. Stalin, the anarchists, or the communists, or Stalin, or whatever you want to say, didn't betray anybody in Spain. They had, they had, they were f all fighting against fascism. Yeah. I see that, and I see that f far too often still, Seps, like, USSR betrayed Spain. They fucking sent Spain as much aid as they possibly could right up until the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. They didn't have to send anything in the first place, but they did because they were internationalists. Soda. Bug. Come get your sister, bug. Dad. Huh. Look at this kitty and tell me you can't tell she's dead. Look at her. Look at this band kitty. 
<laughs> He's a baddie. Oh, I see Bug over there. Also, the West supported Franco. Yeah, that's that too. The West love fascism. Right? Like, like the only re like, like even France was fucking France loved it. Like, let's be real. Like, it, it, obviously a lot of people in France didn't, but like, uh, huge sections of the French fucking government sure as hell did. A lot of people say like it was uh, him attacking France, but it was just him like attacking other white people that really like hide their hands to having to invade. And the fact that there was like that public pressure. If he, if if Hitler had confined himself to like uh, attacking people in the Congo or something like this, then uh, nobody would have said fucking shit. It would have just been USSR fighting against him, probably. Soda, would you please stop it? I'm trying to read to the comrades here, Kitty. Making it very hard. All right. I'm going to read this other part now. Hopefully the cat will actually let me. The West supported the literal fascists, but somehow Stalin was the real villain for ceasing to send more weapons to the revolution for the revolutionaries insurrectionists. Yeah, like exactly. Like somehow it was his fault that they weren't building up the proper internal forces. Like for whatever reason, they weren't able to build up the proper internal forces. Fine. But that's the fact of the matter. Bug. <laughs> that seems like a bad idea, Bug. She's, she's like going for the cat through the back of the door. <laughs> look at the look. Okay. Yeah. Who's in there, Soda? <laughs> you just see her little hand come out. They're funny. Oh, here comes Bug. Bug! <laughs> Really, GMO? Dang. There's Bug. Look at how tiny she is. I believe she's seven months old. How are you seven months? <laughs> You're too small. Size difference. <laughs> Bug for you. A little bug. A little bug snack for you all. All right. Now they're distracted. I think we can do this. Wow. That shows you the way that Canada treats its uh, pawns that it sends off in, uh, in wars. Treats them as pawns, that, that is. Self-reliance and defense. Self-reliance and defense is a fundamental principle of an independent sovereign state. A state without self-reliant armed forces capable of defending the country 
from the enemies at home and abroad when imperialism exists cannot in fact be called a completely independent sovereign state. Yeah, you might want to see the text, huh? Imperialism is a constant cause of war, and the main force of aggression and war is U.S. imperialism. As the leader said, we do not want war, nor do, are we afraid of it, nor do we beg peace from the imperialists. The best way to preserve national independence and peace and win the revolutionary cause is to counter the imperialist war of aggression with the war of liberation. Answer the counter-revolutionary violence of reaction with revolutionary violence. And always meet the imperialist moves of aggression and war in full preparedness. For this purpose, we must implement the principle of self-reliance in defense. Okay, welcome in, comrade. Shout out for uh, K. How do you say? Make sure you follow K. Another fantastic uh, streamer on here who also does the reading. Oh, another place you can go and learn from. Reading about uh, Palestine right now, I do believe. Highly recommend you follow her. No problem, comrade. I caught a bit of your stream. I was lurking. I was I ha I was doing a bunch of stuff in the background, but I was lurking and listening to you, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Self-reliant defense is a military guarantee for a nation's political independence and economic self-sufficiency. Not a problem. I love listening to you read. Only when one implements the principle of self-reliant defense will one be able to repel imperialist aggression and intervention, defend the nation's political independence and economic self-sufficiency, and safeguard the revolutionary achievements and the security of the people. Implementing the principle of self-reliant defense means defending one's country by one's own effort. Of course, one may receive aid in national defense from fraternal countries and friends. But it is impossible to depend on others for defense of one's own country. To depend on others for defense of one's own country, in any case, the main thing is one's own strength. Only when one is strong will foreign aid prove effective. In national defense, therefore, one should rely on the efforts of one's own people, one's own defense capability before anything else. Defense work, too, is an undertaking for the people and of the people themselves. If all the people participate in unison in the national liberation struggle and in the defense of the country, under the leadership of the Revolutionary Party, they will be able to repel all imperialist aggression and safeguard national independence and revolutionary achievements. In order to implement the principle of self-reliant defense, one must have armed forces capable of defending one's country. Such armed forces must embrace the sons and daughters of the working people, an army whose men and commanding officers come from among the workers, peasants, and other working people. Notice how they specify here, by the way, an army whose men and commanding officers. Um, in the West, if you don't know, a lot of times they, there, there are certain mechanisms to essentially make sure a lot of commanding officers in the West are uh, not of the working people, we'll say. Well, the, the poorest are the ones who are most often used as pawns in actual combat. An army whose men and commanding officers come from among the workers, peasants, and other working people can guarantee unity between the army and the people, and between superiors and subordinates and become a truly self-reliant people's army which safeguards national independence and the revolutionary achievements and serves the people. 
if the principle of self-reliant defense is to be implemented, a defense system involving all the people and the whole country must be established. The establishment of such a defense system requires that the whole of the army must be turned into a cadre army and modernized. Only when the whole army is a cadre army, which means that um, lower ranks can do the job of their rank above them, if that's what a cadre basically means, um, only when the whole army is a cadre army will it become strong and provide the necessary force of commanders and multiply its strength in case of need. And a modernized army, which blends its politico-ideological superiority with modern technology, will become a really uncomparable revolutionary army. In order to set up an all-people, all-nation defense system, it is also necessary to arm all the people and fortify the whole country. And I've explained before how DPRK with worker-peasant Red Guards they do. Everybody in DPRK is essentially armed and trained. And at the moment of an invasion, there are local um, buildings nearby, like every community where you, they can arm themselves in the event of an invasion. The likely event. And hopefully not with their, uh, their, hopefully their nuclear deterrent prevents that, but you know. The imperialists are basically frothing at the mouth to set off a regional war that includes China, Korea, Iran. Sounds like an arms race? What sounds like an arms race? Building up your defense? Building up necessary defense for your country sounds like an arms race. Sounds like some liberal bullshit to me, but what do I know? Yes. How is how is built? Oh, so I see. You should just you should just remain defenseless in the face of imperialism and colonialism, right? That makes sense. Building up your defense isn't a fucking arms race. The imperialists are the ones who uh, who engage in. Um, that com the imperialists are always raising, increasing their ability to aggress on others, regardless of other people's defensive capabilities. That's not an arms race. And that's why it's actually an arms chase, because with the imperialists constantly increasing their capabilities for war and every other country racing to be able to defend themselves against it. The more you defend, the more others will defend. Uh, that... That doesn't make any sense, I'm, I'm sorry to say. One side is an aggressor, one side defends. It's not both sides are trying to defend more and more. That's a fucking, that's like a Western, <laughs> that's a completely like Western, like your deep throat in the Western boot there. Like, you're, you're implying that, you're somehow implying that U.S. imperialists are just defending themselves. Are you fucking kidding me? Unless it's pure defense, no offense. You're not making any fucking sense. One second you say both sides are defending themselves, and now you're saying unless it's pure defense. Uh, who the fuck has DPRK attacked? Who has Cuba attacked? Where, and now let's think about the other side of it. Hmm. Where has the West attacked? Oh, I guess a more, I guess an easier question for you to answer would be, where has the West not attacked? Or made war? Or color revolution? Or covert fucking operations? To overthrow some fucking leader that they didn't like? Are you fucking kidding me? Where'd you come from anyway? Are you from Madstream? What the fuck is going on? You learn you learn nothing <laughs> like you learn nothing about the way the world works. You come in here with this like grade school fucking Western understanding of the fucking world? Holy shit. 
your I guess your grade school history teacher would be proud of you or something, maybe. Totally asinine comment. Anyways, I'll let I'll let I'll let comrades in in uh I, I, I see that. I'm just letting them, I'm letting them cook, but I'll let comrades in chat handle that while I continue reading. <clears throat> the establishment of such a defense system requires... Oh, right, okay. In order to set up an all-people, all-nation defense system necessary to have to arm all the people and fortify the whole country. When all the people are under arms and the whole country becomes a fortress, all the people can be mobilized to crush the enemy as soon as it comes in to attack from any quarter. To come in to attack, aka to invade. You know, pure defense? Fucking. Um, and defend the country from imperialist aggression with credit. If the principle of self reliant defense is to be implemented, the political ideological superiority of the people's armed forces should be utilized to the maximum. The decisive factor for victory in war does not consist in weapons or techniques, but in the high political enthusiasm and revolutionary, revolutionary devotion of the army and the masses who are noble, who are conscious of the justice of their cause. A noble revolutionary spirit to fight for the freedom and liberation of the people. Boundless loyalty to the party and the leader, a peerless self-sacrificing spirit, and mass, that is, collective heroism, which are expressed in willingly giving up one's youth and life for the sake of the country and the revolution, revolutionary comradeship between men and officers, their inseparable links with the people, and voluntarily, voluntary military discipline. These are political ideological superiority peculiar to a people's army, a revolutionary army. So these aspects that I just listed there are things that imperialist bourgeois armies can never possess. Because, you see, if their armies were to possess these things, they would overthrow their own, would overthrow their own governments. As the history of revolutionary war shows, a revolutionary army, which is fir in firm political ideological readiness, though armed, no armed with inferior weapons, can fight and defeat an enemy equipped with the latest arms. Indeed, political ideological superiority is the essential merit of revolutionary armed forces and the source of their invincibility. See, so what he's saying here is their political ideological um, consciousness makes them an even more invincible weapon than any like advanced weaponry could possibly. And if you want me, want me to give you like one little like anecdote about that from like an example with Korea and their context in their contest against. Um, the U.S. The U.S. at one time was constantly flying SR-71 Blackbirds, which was at the time the fastest, stealthiest jet in the world, over DPRK in these in regular intervals. Um, spying, of course, on DPRK, taking uh, reconnaissance photos, um, invading their airspace in a country they are still technically at war with. So in response to this, DPRK prepared... Um, a conventional missile. And yeah, see ya. Bye bye, jackass. And um, <laughs> with this conventional missile, and knowing the timing of where this SR Blackbird kept patrolling, they were able to fire it so that it passed so close to this SR 71 Blackbird that the pilot got like scared half to death. And uh, it forced the US to apologize. Which is an incredible feat, but it, you know, 
even though they have, which goes to show, even though they have uh, inferior uh, weapons and technologies compared to the most powerful fucking military on Earth, it still means nothing in the face of, like, having better strategy. Right? No, I don't, and not just that, but being in a defensive stance also comes with certain advantages as well, as we know. Look at, look at Stalingrad for a dramatic example of that, for example. But uh, pretty much any, 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 war, any war of invasion. The principle of self-reliant defense to be implemented requires that one must build one's own defense industry. A national defense industry is a material guarantee for self-reliant armed forces. Particularly at this time when the U.S. and other imperialists are viciously maneuvering, subjugate others' countries by offering arms as a bait and plundering pe other people's resources and making huge profits through arms deals. The newly independent countries should build their own defense industry. This is of tremendous significance. True, it will be difficult for small countries to, to produce all the arms they need, but it would be inadvisable to depend totally on others for the arms. They should build and develop their own defense industries so that they can produce whatever is within their power. Um, and I just want to point out here, look, the, the, the ability to do this has been proven without, a, without any shadow of a doubt right by Gaza. If Gaza can build their own weapons, their own like defense industry and shit, anybody can do it. Any country can able can do it to a, an extent that is necessary um, to defend themselves. It proves the correctness of the of of what they're saying here. And uh, and same with Yemen too, right? Like. Yemen's defense industry and defense capabilities as well. Same deal. It proves what DPRK is saying here is absolutely correct. In order to implement the principle of self-reliant defense, it is essential to consolidate the home front. As the leader instructed, victory or defeat in modern war depends largely on whether or not manpower and material resources necessary for the war effort are insured for a long period. If a nation is to be ready to cope with war, they must build up major strategic zones, store up necessary material reserves, and make full preparations from the peacetime so as to continue with production even in the case of contingency. Upholding the policy of building the economy and defense simultaneously, our party has made good preparations both militarily and materially and built up both the frontline areas and home front to cope with war. We will continue to fully implement the policy of self-reliant defense and thus further strengthen our self-reliant armed forces to be invincible, fight back any enemy aggression, and defend the country and revolutionary achievements faithfully. There you go. There is all your, those are all the aspects of maintaining the principle of the independent stand in revolution, which, as I, as I said at the beginning of this, is a necessary, necessary principles for every revolution. Hey, altruism. No worries, no worries. I don't like, yeah, I don't like yelling at people. I just, I just... I just send them on their merry way. <laughs> uh, I critique people. I don't yell at them. That's counterproductive. I also don't, I don't like to just insult people either. You might notice I, I don't, I tend not to engage with personal insults against people. It's just easier to just critique their, their crappy positions. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. Yes, so, as I mentioned before, this is what we just talked about here, these aspects of maintaining um, independent, maintaining the independent stand in revolution. These are not just something that's unique for Korea to do in its revolution. This is necessary 
for every single revolutionary movement without exception. So just keep that in mind. And remember, the first one that we talked about was Juche and ideology, which meant to know your own things and to create your own revolutionary theory and ideology based on your own conditions, the criteria of your own people, and to know your own things more than you know, or at least know your own things as well or better than you know um, DPRK or USSR or all these other places. And only then can you create creative and independent theory capable of winning revolution.